This video will look at four integral parts of the Stonehenge ritual Neolithic landscape that either hardly anyone ever visits or don't notice as they go to see the famous stone circle. And it isn't the part that's on the screen now. So, join me on a journey to the unseen Stonehenge. <laughs> The Cuckoo Stone is a horizontal sarsen monolith, situated on the broader Salisbury Plain and Stonehenge site, and similar to the large stones found at the Neolithic Circle itself, but this sole stone has an intriguing story to tell too. Positioned around 1600 feet east of Woodhenge, it shares its vicinity with Durrington Walls to the northeast, and is located about a mile and a half southwest of Stonehenge itself. Notably catalogued by Richard Colt Hoare in 1810, this geological feature has been the subject to archaeological scrutiny, particularly during the 2007 Stonehenge Riverside Project excavation. That particular excavation brought to light the original pit where the stone rested, indicating that it was initially a natural formation before becoming an object of ritual practices. About 3,500 BC, Neolithic farmers built a long barrow close by, of which scant remains are now visible. During the Neolithic period, the cuckoo stone was placed upright less than a few feet from its current location in the corner of the now-named Cuckoo Stone Field. About 2500 BC, when the nearby settlement at Durrington was in use, those who dwelt there built a row of enormous timber structures that stood just to the south of the concentric wooden monument known as Woodhenge. These may have been timber platforms or buildings connected with the dead or ancestors. Later, during the early Bronze Age, a round barrow cemetery was built on the spot where they had stood. Also in the Bronze Age, the cremated remains of three people were buried in pots near the Cuckoo Stone, alluding to its continued veneration. The site, and by extension the stone, remained a significant ritual focal point for millennia. During the Roman occupation, a rectangular structure was built southwest of the Cuckoo Stone. Evidenced by pits and a scattering of coins, this construction bore the hallmarks of a small shrine. This stone, which has been lifted up, laid down and moved around a bit, but not much, has been a silent witness and sometime ritual object over thousands of years of history from its seat in this field in Wiltshire. If it could talk, it would have such a story to tell, but even with study and excavation in the area, it may never give up all its secrets. Woodhenge is a fascinating Neolithic monument nestled in Wiltshire, a couple of miles away from the Stonehenge Stone Circle. Although often overshadowed by its more famous and more lithic near namesake, and unknown to my taxi driver, who had lived in nearby Amesbury all his life, this wooden structure holds its own special significance to how Neolithic people lived and enacted ritual practices. The site currently consists of a dizzying array of concrete posts that mark where wooden columns, long since rotted away, once stood. There now follows some rather blustery on-site reporting, before we return to some more tranquilly recorded details. Hello from a windy Woodhenge in Wiltshire. Uh, I'm currently in the middle of Woodhenge. Uh, you can see they have these, which are actually concrete um, small bollards here which represent the uh, what would have been wooden uh, obviously far taller than this this is just to show where the holes were found they were discovered by a um, well, effectively by a pilot doing uh, aerial photography who spotted something strange in this field the pilot spotted some odd shape in this field and uh, it was later excavated and uh, properly and um, they found many many post holes uh, some larger some smaller <clears throat> and uh, some of the holes uh, were at least six feet deep uh, which is estimated to be able to hold a pole the length of 25 feet so I'm currently sitting on a red one they're color-coded to show the sizes and this would have been one of the larger ones so there would have been a pole here 25 feet potentially in the sky and surrounded by all of these other ones it would have been an incredibly impressive sight 
And this is an artist's rendering of that incredibly impressive site. There were six concentric oval rings of posts, built at about the same time as Stonehenge. The wooden posts were a variety of sizes, with those in the largest ring, marked by red pillars, possibly standing up to 9 metres, or between 25 to 29 feet tall, and weighing up to 5 tonnes. The oval rings were broadly aligned in the direction of midsummer sunrise and midwinter sunset, the same as Stonehenge. A low ditch and bank to the left and right are noticeable on entry to the site. This is a henge built to enclose this sacred space. Two standing stones, probably sarsen, were also added to the monument. Historians and archaeologists do not know how Woodhenge was used, but people placed many objects and animal bones among the posts, even after some of them had rotted. These included grooved ware pottery, carved chalk objects, antler picks and flint tools. Fragments of human bone were also found here, as well as two later burials, a child near the centre, today marked by a flint cairn, and a young man in the ditch. The Neolithic era was characterised by advancements in agriculture, the establishment of settled communities, and the development of complex belief systems. Against this backdrop, the people of ancient Britain undertook ambitious construction projects, and Woodhenge stands, or rather stood, as a testament to their ingenuity. The monument's name, Woodhenge, draws a parallel to Stonehenge, but it is essential to note the stark differences in construction, notably, and perhaps predictably, the use of wood rather than stone. Woodhenge's purpose remains a subject of speculation and debate. Some theories suggest that it served as a ceremonial or ritualistic site, perhaps used for religious gatherings, celebrations or astronomical observations. Others propose that it had practical functions, such as a burial ground or a marker for seasonal agricultural events. One of the striking features of Woodhenge is its alignment with the summer solstice. Just like Stonehenge, it seems that the ancient builders carefully positioned the monument to interact with the celestial movements. The alignment with significant astronomical events hints at the importance of these sky cycles in the spiritual and practical lives of the Neolithic people. Archaeological excavations at Woodhenge have unearthed valuable insights into the lives of its ancient creators. The timber posts, although long decayed, left distinct patterns in the soil, allowing researchers to reconstruct the monument's original layout. The meticulous arrangement of these posts indicates a sophisticated understanding of geometry and architectural planning. Woodhenge's discovery in the early 20th century marked a turning point in our understanding of prehistoric Britain. As you may have heard in my blustery description, the site was initially identified through aerial photography, revealing the ghostly outlines of the wooden circles beneath the surface. Subsequent excavations led by archaeologist Maud Cunnington revealed the full extent of the monument and provided crucial data for piecing together its history. The construction of Woodhenge involved a considerable investment of labour and resources. The transportation and positioning of large timber posts would have required careful coordination and skilled craftsmanship. As with many ancient monuments, the significance of Woodhenge likely extended beyond its physical structure. The act of constructing such a site, with its intricate design and alignment, suggests a communal effort driven by shared beliefs and cultural practices. It reflects a society capable of organising collective endeavours, both for practical and symbolic purposes. Woodhenge's role in the broader cultural landscape of the wider Stonehenge site, and Neolithic Britain in general, invites ongoing exploration and interpretation. One theory that I have quite a lot of time for posits that the choice of wood over stone references that this site was a place for the living, as opposed to the Stonehenge site that was deemed as a dwelling place for the ancestors, whose role in Neolithic society did not end with their deaths. This theory has added weight given the Woodhenge ring's proximity to the dwelling known as Durrington, where it is believed the megalith builders lived. The mysterious heel stone stands as a sentinel to the mysteries and marvels of Stonehenge. But as you can see here, it lies outside of the stone circle, quite some distance away, and visitors often file past it, giving it a glance, but their eyes are drawn, transfixed to the circular monument beyond. Unlike the sarsens and blue stones of the ring structure, the heel stone is an unworked, that is, not carved, sarsen. It appears incongruous in the presence of the shaped and sculpted stones, but the heel stone is, in many ways, the most significant megalith at the site. It was possibly erected around 2500 BC, although some have theorised that this stone has stood here for millions of years and was at the Salisbury Plain site long before the stone circle was built. This theory states that the heel stone was a natural wonder to the ancient megalith builders that in some way inspired them to add the monument in relation to it. 
The Heelstone's position along the avenue, a processional pathway leading from the River Avon to Stonehenge, hints at its ceremonial and ritualistic importance. This avenue served as a symbolic pathway for ancient rituals, possibly linked to the cycles of the sun, moon and stars. Archaeological studies and astronomical observations have revealed that the Heelstone aligns with the sunrise during the summer solstice, marking the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. This alignment suggests a deep understanding of astronomical phenomena by the builders of Stonehenge and underscores the monument's connection to celestial events. The name Heelstone likely originates from its position relative to the main circle, appearing to heel or lean against the larger stones when viewed from certain angles. This unique perspective adds to the stone's mystique, inviting interpretations about its role in the rituals and ceremonies that were conducted at Stonehenge. One of the prevailing theories regarding the Heelstone's purpose is its symbolic representation of life and death. As the sun rises over the Heelstone during the summer solstice, casting long shadows and illuminating the monument, it symbolises the cycle of life, growth and renewal. Conversely, during the winter solstice, the sun sets opposite the Heelstone, marking the longest night of the year and symbolising darkness, death and the cycle of rebirth. During these times, the stone lines up with the monument and the sun beyond like an arrow. The Heelstone's alignment with celestial events also raises questions about the astronomical knowledge and cultural practices of the ancient people who constructed Stonehenge. It speaks to their deep connection with the natural world, the changing seasons and their attempts to interpret and harness the power of celestial bodies in their daily lives and spiritual beliefs. As alluded to, added to this astronomical significance, the Heelstone likely played a role in the overall layout and design of Stonehenge as a sacred space. Its position outside the main circle suggests a boundary or marker between the mundane world and the sacred realm, possibly that of the dead or the ancestors, encapsulated within the stone circle. Whilst the current custodians of the Stonehenge site have sought to highlight this stone's importance, it is often overlooked by those who have come to see the spectacular circle that lies both separate and intrinsically connected. Durrington Walls in Wiltshire is a part of the larger Stonehenge ritual site that doesn't get many visitors. There are no massive megaliths to see here, but it was once the literal lifeblood of the spectacular monument just a couple of miles away. This was once the home of the ancient builders, who toiled to create the enigmatic stone circle, for reasons that are analogous to those that saw the creation of the world's finest cathedrals and temples thousands of years later. Despite its lack of footfall and dearth of sarsen superstructures, there's not nothing to see here. There is an enormous earth bank that serves as a spectre of what once was, for this was also a henge, a gigantic one. Henge being the bank and ditch surrounding, rather than the stone centrepiece. In fact, technically speaking, Stonehenge isn't actually a henge, but Durrington Walls is. This Neolithic site, dating back over 4,500 years, exudes an untouched quality where imagination, rather than spectacle, takes over. And when you apply just a modicum of that imagination, then the spectacle follows shortly after, especially when you consider the enormous effort it would have taken to terraform the earth in this remarkable way, using only antler picks. So this uh, seemingly innocuous looking field behind me is anything but. When you look at it, you can see that it's been extensively modified. Uh, deliberately, it's actually been built like that behind me. Just over my, my ear there, you can see a huge bank which uh, demarks this as part of a large henge. And this is Durrington Walls, where it's believed that the megalith builders may have lived as a, as a community, I suppose. And this is uh, very close to Woodhenge, which is up just over this hill here. Uh, and this is very much the land of the living in the Neolithic. So. Uh, and this is where they lived. So, characterised by the wood of Woodhenge, is meant to, or believed to represent the, uh, the, the idea of the living, whereas the stone of Stonehenge, which is close by, and also the Cuckoo Stone, which is um, in an adjacent field and is part of a long barrow, uh, that was made of stone, and stone is said to be the, uh, the dwelling place of the dead, or rather the ancestors. Uh, so, here we are at Durrington Walls.
So this site feels more alive than Stonehenge, and that's because it was. Stonehenge was widely held to represent an ancestral plane, whereas Durrington Walls, sacred space that it undoubtedly was, was a breathing, heaving, probably literally, settlement. As mentioned, the most notable feature of Durrington Walls is a massive circular earthwork enclosure, measuring about 1,600 feet in diameter. This remarkable structure was constructed using chalk and earth, creating a formidable boundary that enclosed an area of approximately 30 acres. Within this enclosure, evidence of ancient structures, post holes and other archaeological features have been unearthed, shedding light on the purpose and significance of Durrington Walls in prehistoric times. One of the intriguing aspects of Durrington Walls was its connection to Stonehenge. The two sites are somewhat linked by the avenue, a ceremonial pathway marked by parallel lines of stones and timber posts. This alignment suggests a symbolic or ritualistic connection between Durrington Walls and Stonehenge, sparking theories about their shared religious or ceremonial importance. Archaeological excavations at Durrington Walls have revealed a complex settlement with evidence of dwellings, workshops and other structures. The presence of numerous post holes indicates the existence of timber buildings, possibly used for housing or communal ritual activities. The sheer scale of the settlement suggests a sizeable and organised community that sheds light on the social structure and daily life of its ancient inhabitants. The function of Durrington Walls as a ceremonial or ritualistic site is further supported by the discovery of feasting debris. Excavations at the site have revealed evidence of large-scale gatherings and feasts, with remnants of animal bones and pottery suggesting communal activities. The notion of feasting and rituals adds a communal and social dimension to the site, indicating that it played a central role in the lives of the people who inhabited or visited the area. In honour of this revelry, and anachronistic though it is, I couldn't resist a bit of indulgent jaw-harp playing at the site. One of the enduring mysteries surrounding Durrington Walls is the purpose of its massive earthwork enclosure. The sheer effort required to construct such a monument raises questions about the motivations of its builders. Some researchers propose that the enclosure served as a symbolic boundary, marking a sacred space for rituals or ceremonies. Others suggest that it functioned as a place of pilgrimage, drawing people from different regions to participate in communal events. The relationship between Durrington Walls and Stonehenge has been the focal point of research and speculation. The avenue, connecting the two sites, hints at a ceremonial or processional function, emphasising the interconnectedness of these Neolithic monuments. The proximity of Durrington Walls to Stonehenge, as well as Woodhenge, suggests a shared cultural or religious landscape, with all three sites potentially serving complementary roles in the spiritual practices of their ancient builders. I can't help but thinking that more people really should visit as an accompaniment to the Stone Circle. These sites did not exist in isolation, they should be taken as being different aspects of the same ancient story. But that's it for this video, don't forget to like, share and most importantly subscribe, and you can also support the channel on Subscribestar via the link in the description, or via YouTube Super Thanks. Thanks for watching, bye for now.